What happens when two bass road warriors spend quality time talking music and life with one of their peers? Bassist educator author David C. Gross and bassist and head honcho of KnowYourBassPlayer.com, Tom Semioli, trade eights with the legends of rock, jazz, funk, blues, folk, country, and more. Notes from an artist. Revealing conversations with the legends who've created the soundtrack of our lives. What happens? You're about to find out. It's another episode of Notes from an Artist. David, what a fascinating guest Alan Shipton will be for our listeners. And for those of you listening at home, Alan Shipton is an English jazz author. He is a presenter, which is what they call TV hosts in England, David. He does BBC radio and he does BBC television. He is a journalist that is not afraid to criticize his peers, as we will learn in the interview. And David, would you believe he's a bass player? Of course he's a bass player. Most of the most intelligent people on the planet are bass players. That's why we're in the political trouble we are because no one in the White House is a bass player. Exactly. But seriously, the reason we picked up on Alan Shifton was because one of my favorite bass players in jazz is a German cat named Eberhard Weber. And what's curious about this interview is we got involved with this interview because he just edited an autobiography of Eberhard Weber. So originally we're thinking, oh boy, we're going to have a lot of interesting conversations about Jan Gaborek and about all these great ECM musicians who Eberhard Weber played with. But what you guys are going to notice, we talk very little about Eberhard Weber, and we talk about all this incredible jazz from Europe starting in the the, the 60s. And what makes this such an incredible interview is the fact that a couple of days ago, I go, Tom, I've got almost two hours of material, and I haven't gotten done with it. So what's great is we're going to be two parts. So tonight you're going to hear part A, obviously, and then next Monday night you'll hear part two. What I love about talking to Alan, talking with Alan, is like us, David, he's very simpatico with Notes from an Artist, is he's been there and done that. He has been on the bandstand, so his writing has a particular insight that I think journalists who are non-musicians just just cannot uh, achieve. Some of the books that Alan's written are incredible. He's written about Fats Waller. He's written about Bud Powell. He's written about Dizzy Gillespie. He's done a history of jazz book. He's written about Ian Carr. He's written about Cab Calloway. He did probably one of the definitive books on Harry Nilsson and also co-authored a lot of books, uh, one with Billy J. Kramer. Uh, His two bands are recording artists as well, Alan Shipton's New Orleans Jazz Friends, and he also does Buck Clayton's Legacy Band which uh, perform regularly in the UK. So this guy's been there. He's been on the bandstand. He's been in the studio. So he offers insight that only you and I can, David. That's exactly right. And he's a gentle soul, real intelligent cat. And I think you guys are going to really enjoy this interview. So without further ado, da-da-da-da! Here's Alan. Hey, Alan. Hello. Greetings. Greetings from the Bronx, New York. Greetings from, uh, where are you in Connecticut, David? I'm in Woodbury, Connecticut. Woodbury and what part of in the God's United? country? Yes. And I'm four miles outside Oxford, UK. I thought you were in Paris. Uh, I thought I was going to be, but I'm not going for a little while. I live here all the time, but, um, you know, sometimes uh, we're in France. Fabulous. Well, we're big fans of your show. I think our show and the work you do were pretty simpatico, where you aim to inform and to educate. Of course, you being a bass player, you're really simpatico. Absolutely. Well, the bass is just over the other side of this room. But uh... <laughs> David, we're not showing off. Usually David and I have our basses in the background, but we didn't do that. Today. We've all been very restrained today. <laughs> How was <laughs> your I gig? Can see, I can see a keyboard in the background of David. Yes. The spinet or something. Yeah. How was your gig in Dorset? You just did a gig in Dorset, what, two weeks ago? Oh, a little bit longer ago than that. It was great. Um, we were playing in a, a Norman church and uh, in a tiny village, and it was packed. It was absolutely great. We were doing very traditional music. We did the George Lewis Jazz at Vespers concert. The New Orleans band recorded in Oxford, Ohio, uh, 67 years ago. That was George Lewis and the Easy Riders Jazz Vance Live doing Just a Little While to Stay Here. This is Notes from an Artist on CygnusRadio.com. We kicked off here in the big uh, converted church. Uh, There's now a great concert hall in Oxford, sponsored by Steinway. So they've got an absolutely uh, magnificent Model C. And probably we've ever played with wants to work there because it's just, just such a fabulous piano. It was a great echoing barn of a place, but they've sorted out the acoustics and now it's a concert hall. It's fantastic. Really nice place. So we launched the uh, the thing on the 65th anniversary of the concert there and we came back and played again this year before 
before we went to Dorset. Very nice. Very nice. Now, David and I are primary electric bases. David, I believe, has an upright somewhere. I'm uh, 100% electric. I'm old school. And we've um, interviewed quite a few upright. You mean old school as of the 1950s? Yes, exactly. And uh, we've interviewed uh, Ron Carter a few times. We've had Larry Grenadier as a guest. And uh, who are the other upright players? What about Dave Swift? A neighbor of yours? What about Dave Swift? Yeah. Right. The, the UK's most recognizable basis that, of course, a guy by the name of Gary Carr, who everyone should know about. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Tell us about your upright base, because unlike the electric, the upright is it constantly needs to be maintained. It's it's not just an instrument. It's a lifestyle. My long term base that I had for a very long time was uh, a 19th century Viennese base. And basically, when I went out on a gig, it was like taking a very old piece of furniture. Um, the stage lights would make the cracks open or seize up. Buzzes would suddenly appear that you had no idea where they were coming from. And in the end, I decided three year, four years ago that I was going to make a change. And just down the road from me here in Oxfordshire is a wonderful American bass virtuoso, Thomas Martin. That was the London Symphony Orchestra with Thomas Martin on bass. The piece was by Karsavetsky. It was his concerto and it was the first movement. Great bass playing on that one. And this is Notes from an Artist on CygnusRadio.com. He used to play with uh, the New York Phil and then he came and worked with the London Symphony Orchestra for a while. He was a luthier in his spare time and he and his son, George, make fantastic basses. So they've actually built me a bass. And it's built on the lines of a classic 19th century English bass and it's gorgeous. And guess what? it doesn't suddenly open up the cracks onto stage lights. So I love it. I see right behind your head is one of my favorite books on jazz improvisation. There are there's about 300 jazz books on the shelf. If you turn around, the one that has jazz very, very loudly. Oh, yes. On the third shelf. The Oxford Companion. Oh, fantastic book. Yes. Well, you know my background in this, that I was the consultant editor for the New Grove Dictionary of Jazz. No, we did not know that. Oh, well, I was a publisher for years, and that is kind of why we got into this conversation in the first place, because of recent publications. But uh, mm-hmm. no, I was I ran the music department of Macmillan in the UK for getting on for 10 years. So we did a massive dictionary of musical instruments. We did the Dictionary of American Music, which hadn't been revived since the 1920s. So the wonderful Wiley Hitchcock at Brooklyn College oversaw that. And I was commuting between New York and London uh, in the 80s, which was the perfect time to spend one week a month in New York. And that's actually when I met Ron Carter for the first time, playing in Geo with Jim Hall. And Mm -hmm. the first night I went down, they said, oh, ladies and gentlemen, we hope you don't mind. We've got a guest tonight. And it was Clark Terry. So it was a rather splendid evening. That was the maestro, Ron Carter, and the great guitarist, Jim Hall, doing St. Thomas. This is Notes from an Artist, CygnusRadio.com. Thinking of basses, one of the people, and thinking of five string basses, which we may get onto later, oh. one of the, during that time, was Red Mitchell, tuned his ordinary four string bass in fifths in like fifth. a cello. And I thought, how's he getting that low C without an extension? So when he came past my table, I said, you got it tuned like a cello. And he said, oh, yeah, I'll tell you all about it. So he sat down and for an, half an hour, I got Red Mitchell's lecture on why it was time to play a three-quarter size bass tuned in fifths. And he'd had to stretch a little, but he was using the third finger in a way that most classical bassists don't. And he sounded fantastic. That was a double header of sorts. The first track, It Could Happen to You, was by Red Mitchell. The second track was It Could Happen to You by Chet. Baker, which happens to be one of my favorite Chad Baker tunes. This is Notes from an Artist at CygnusRadio.com. Well, it's interesting you bring that up because in the book, I'm enjoying it. I'm not done with it yet. I've been a fan of Eberhard Weber since 73. I had the first uh, Colors of Chloe on vinyl. It really did bother me that he had tuned his E to a D because I didn't really figure that out that quickly. That was a live version of the Colors of Chloe with Eberhard Weber on bass, Gary Burton on vibes, Mick Goodrick and Pat Metheny on guitar and Bob Moses on drums. This is Notes from an Artist on CygnusRadio.com. He talks about a conversation he had with Red Mitchell when his English was fairly poor and he just nodded throughout most of it and unfortunately did not get all the benefits of uh, Red's commentary. You remember that part? Yeah, and I'm pretty sure he got very much the same discussion from Red that I got, though possibly only understood uh, a smaller fraction of it. But you're right about, uh, I mean, Eberhard tuning and what interests me about that is if you grow up in a family with cellists why don't you adopt cello tuning but he never did and you carry
carried on playing the cello. He played it. I think he plays one track where he double tracks, even on Colors of Chloe. But there's certainly yeah. some of those early albums. He's playing cello as well as bass. That was Eberhard Weber from the album The Colors of Chloe with a tune called More Colors. This is Notes from an Artist on CygnusRadio.com. Mm-hmm. Those records are really pretty exceptional. And it wasn't so much his bass playing and his tone. And I've always thought it was really bizarre. Everyone talks Jocko and they talk this guy, they talk that guy. But when you bring up the name Eberhard Weber, everyone thinks, you mean the number two pencil? So much of his playing is, it's the perfect complement from acoustic to electric. It is the perfect sonic change. And that wasn't all he did, because he ultimately went into loopers, echo, and all that sort of stuff. It's also interesting, because at the beginning of the book, like all good acoustic bassists, he started in classical music. And of course, he had a classical music based family. There's a very big, strong tradition right. behind it. And I mean, I, I like the accounts of when he found himself in later life going on stage in those august German classical concert halls. There's a wonderful thing when he's actually bringing the music from Colors of Chloe to a concert and they get to the last note and there's stunned silence and he thinks, and one little voice goes, boo. And then suddenly the rest of the audience go crazy. I love that scene in the book because he's bringing it full circle. He's bringing his music back into that very atmosphere yeah. in which he grew up. That was Paul McCandless playing with Eberhard Weber on a tune that Eberhard wrote called Pendulum. That was live in Germany, 1995. This is Notes from an Artist at CygnusRadio.com. Where so many people in the same way think of Jocko as this great jazz bassist, it's his compositions. It's Eberhard's compositions that will outlive the actual bass playing, don't you think? Well, I think it's a bit of both. I mean, there are a few things that Jacka will always be associated with, and particularly now some of the unreleased stuff is finally coming out for the first time. It's great to, to have this kind of musical archaeology going on. I went to hear Jacko, pl- funnily enough, also playing in Bradley's in New York, where I met Red. Okay. The problem was he and Mike Stern were there at the same time, and I think they played for a total of 10 minutes in the first set. I'll be right back. Thank you. That was a rare recording of Jocko, Mike Stern, Barry Finity, and Bob Moses doing a tune they called New York City Groove. Just a rare jam that uh, surfaced on YouTube. This is Notes from an Artist on CygnusRadio.com. I once asked Mike about it and he said, they weren't very good days for us, you know. Right, that was a rough Probably period enough for said. But what they did play, I mean, just for that little bit, hearing Jaco 10 feet away from him playing was just one of the great experiences. And his mobility, his fleet, the way he was thinking, you, you could just tell that brain and fingers were operating entirely together there was no right. disjoint there at all and and mike was well up with him at that stage it was it was just a shame that their sets were very truncated for non-musical reasons but it was terrific to have heard them so i've got a first-hand comparison as i heard uh Eberhardt many many times over the years and in a number of different settings including of course uh, the solo concerts, which, as you say, mm-hmm. had all these extra loops and, and other things. And one album that um, it, it's been quite nice, actually, doing these books because ECM have been very supportive. And uh, when we told them that this book was coming out, this lovely album, Once Upon a Time, reappeared. Mm-hmm. And I um, mean, it's just great to have a solo album that pulls together so many of the things that I remember when I first saw him playing one of these solo concerts. And I took my daughter, who's also a bass player, and Uh her previous experience had been Ray Brown. So we got to go and hear Ray. So we went to hear Ray, who's just about the most wonderfully orthodox four-string player you could ever hear. And then I remember her sort of sitting like that, watching... (laughs) Eberhardt, just because nothing about it was anything that she'd really ever learnt about bass playing. But what a fantastic experience for her to hear him at that stage. Interesting concert, so I'm using the word very a lot, but that's one of the words you do with him because nothing is done by half measures. Well, it's also fascinating how um, self-effacing he is, and I would assume in person a very humble person humble guy. We've never actually had a conversation face to face, though obviously we were very much in touch at the early stages of getting the book going. I mean, it appeared in German and a friend of mine who runs a a London jazz blog, who's also a fluent German speaker, got hold of the copy and he just rang me and said, Alan, you have to do this book. So I read it and then I was in touch with Eberhardt, who found us, Heidi, the translator. 
She was right. a friend of his. Okay. And that helped because she could always ask him questions. If she was not getting the nuance or something, she could go to him. And so that it, that's that wonderful personal connection with the translator. And I think it's a very richer, much richer book because of that. What I have done is, of course, to see him many times on stage. And I think you're absolutely right about the self-effacing thing. When I saw him last at the festival hall with the younger Barak group, not long before the stroke, he's there playing and every note's perfect and the sound is great. Um, Rainer Bruninghaus doing his thing it was Trillot Goethe on drums on that occasion uh, and Jan Marilyn Mazur doing sort of dancey percussion in the background. Yeah, yeah. A wonderful evening. But when a solo, a bass solo appeared, something happened to his face. He set his face and he came forward and there was just no arguing with it. He was he was the boss at that point and it, <laughs> it really emerged from the ensemble. That was Eberhard Weber with the Jan Gaberek group in Hamburg, live version of Passing. This is Notes from an Artist, CygnusRadio.com. And it was just such a thrill to hear him in a group ensemble doing the same kind of thing. As you know from my publishing record, I was great friends with Ian Carr and I, I did his biography. Yes. So I had heard Eberhardt in the United Jazz and Rock Ensemble context, which is a very much bigger band. And that was, that was much more where he was playing for the band. But I felt in Young's quartet or quintet, he always had this ability to kind of elbow people aside and assert this wonderful musical personality on the group. Tom and I both love the soft machine. Ian right. Carr's nucleus, a group that probably no one in this country has really heard of called Centipede. Do you remember that? Yeah, Keith. Um, Keith Tippett. At one point had its own private plane. They actually had a private 747 for flying themselves around the world. They would have to. There were so many people in that group. Yeah. That was Centipede doing an edit from September Energy, which was an hour and 20 minute Two LP set back in 1971. This is Notes from an Artist on CygnusRadio.com. It's funny, uh, the American scene and the English scene were going on simultaneously, and they were doing very similar things. Even Chris McGregor, when he came over from South Africa, just some brilliant, brilliant music. That was Chris McGregor's Brotherhood of Breath, a song called MRA, from their very first album in America. It was on the RCA Neon label which I've never seen since that recording. This is Notes from an Artist on CygnusRadio.com. It's not just, just these two books. You're a journalist. You're a bassist. You're an editor. It's amazing how many things one has to do in this business. But Equinox, if I go back and I start looking at all the, oh, I want that book. Oh, I want that book. Oh, just send them all to me. I'll, I'll, I'll get to them all. Just some fascinating jabs. And to me, I think back then in the day, Val Wilmer's book was the only book that I knew of coming out of Britain at that time for, for jazz. That's true. Of course, though, Ian Carr himself uh, did the great Miles Davis biography, which, which yes. is the antidote to the autobiography with Quincy Troop. They're two very different right takes on Miles and Ian would get quite worked up about it and say well he, he just didn't remember he just, he, he just didn't remember he just, and, and I can imagine Ian sort of like a coiled spring sort of talking yeah. about certain parts of it but of course the other great link is that he wrote the first biography of Jarrett and right. when we came to do the Keith Jarrett book at Equinox it was wonderful that I'd worked with Ian not only at, at the time that he was it would have been his autobiography but he was Ian was going down with the early stages of Alzheimer's so the deal was that I would write a biography, but Ian dictated on good days very large amounts of it. So it's a it's a joint effort completely. And yeah. I first met Ian when I was 16, and he was playing with Michael Garrick's band doing a jazz and poetry concert. And my school band was allowed to go and sit in on the rehearsals and then hear them. And blow me, last Sunday night was the 60th anniversary of the Michael Garrick and Jeremy Robson. That was the Michael Garrick Sextet doing their 60th anniversary concert, which was jazz from St. Paul's Cathedral. This is Notes from an Artist on CygnusRadio.com jazz and poetry concerts. Jeremy's still going strong in his 80s. Wow. He read several poems. And from that original group, Art Thiemann on saxophone was playing on Sunday night here in Oxford. And oh, Mike Garrick's yeah. son, Chris Garrick, was playing violin and leading the band. So it was an, And Dave Green, who also played frequently with Ian Carr uh, and those guys, was on bass. So it was a wonderful connection back to that yeah. world where, I mean, having met Ian at a formative age, obviously we followed Nucleus, my, my school friends and I, right through the early career of the band, oh, as it mm -hmm. happened just in our last two years of school before we went on to, to university. And it was amazing then when I would persuade the people running college dances in the other Oxford colleges to book Nucleus. And we I remember climbing over the wall into another college to go and hear a set 
by a nucleus. <laughs> Tickets were, even in those days, £100 a head. This is wow. the 1970s. So it was a good thing to have a stepladder and uh, uh, get over the wall to hear <laughs> nucleus. Wow. And that is only part one of our interview with Alan Shipton. I want to thank Alan and, of course, my partner in crime, Tom Somioli, for another insightful interview with a truckload of great music. Folks, where can you find anywhere on the planet a song list that is this diverse? Wait until next week for part two of our interview, as well as a lot more interesting music. And by the way, if you would like to re-listen to this broadcast or want to revisit other Notes from an Artist broadcast, you can find every last one of them on the Notes from an Artist podcast, available with all major podcast sites. So... We look forward to seeing you next week. Have a great week, and thanks for listening. All the best.